Okay. So we have to make two exercises. One that, that I, I have left to you. So one is the following for any delta positive the limit as t goes to 0 plus of uh, the notation was phi to 0 uniformly uniformly uh, where phi was the heat kernel phi phi was uh, 1 over 4 pi t to the n over 2 e to the minus x squared over 4 t for any t equal or equal than 0 and x. This is the heat kernel. Solving ut minus Laplace of u in zero plus infinity times. So it is a solution of uh, of the heat equation uh, for positive times in the wall space. So if x uh, is bigger or equal than delta, then e to the minus x squared over 40 is less than or equal than uh, e to the minus delta squared over 40. Hmm? t is positive. If and So therefore, the supremum over x uh, such that x is, is less, bigger or equal than delta of phi of tx. So phi is the product of a positive number times this exponential. So we have 1 over 4 pi t to the n over 2. And then uh, this is bounded by e to the minus delta over 4t. And therefore, the limit as t goes to 0, as t goes to 0 from, the, from above, of the supremum over x you can recall the delta of phi of tx is equal to 0. <coughs> which is the assertion. OK? So uniformly, our function is going to 0 on all um, sets of this form. This was the first exercise. Then, is it, is it clear? OK. The second exercise is, again, another property that says, essentially, that phi concentrated the origin in this space-time. So we have the second exercise was the limit for any delta positive, the limit as t goes to 0, the integral um, this was the second exercise. OK? So to do the, third, the second, so this, this is the one, the first exercise is the second. 
So again, it says that on sets of this form, the contribution to the integral, uh, if, you, if you take a movie in time of the kernel, we have already seen that uh, as t goes to 0 from, from, abo from above, we have sort of a function like this, where here the area uh, be below the, the graph of the and above the x-axis, and so the area here is always equal to one. So this this uh, this says that if I fix now delta, so minus delta delta, and then I integrate the function phi. When t goes to zero, uh, this area only this part say this area here. When t goes to zero, goes to zero. This is the, ge ge the geometric picture, OK? Uh, So let us first do the computation, a one dimension. To, to, to solve exercise number two, let us first do a computation in one dimension. So assume for the moment n is equal to 1. Take a positive number a. So and let, and let us integrate uh, over x bigger or equal than a of e to the minus uh, y square dy for the moment. Let, let us do first this, this one dimensional computation. So what is this? So this is uh, so the, the, of course we cannot I mean this is equal to 2 integral on this um, dy Okay. Well, all this is obvious. But unfortunately, we cannot do this integral unless uh, the domain of integration is, say, the wall, the wall R. But surely we are not able to do it in, the, in this uh, interval here, A plus infinity. However, if Y is in A plus infinity, so we know that uh, y divided by a is bigger than 1, huh? of course. So if, if, then. And therefore, here I can put a number larger than 1, obtaining the following. So I have y divided by a, y divided by a, e to the minus y squared dy. OK? This is clear because this is larger than 1 on this interval. Now, so this is equal to 2 over a, the integral e to the minus y e to the minus y squared dy. Hmm? And you see now the reason why I, I made this trick, because now I am able to do this integral. So this trick is a way to, uh, to, make, to make appear the, 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 the term y here. That allows to make the integral now explicitly. Of course, I have a less than or equal to. So I'm losing something, but at least I am able to do the integral. 
So, and this I do. So, uh, and this is equal to what? Uh, so the primitive is one half uh, e to the minus y square with the minus. And so this is equal to, uh, I think it is equal to 2 over a. And then I have 1 half e to the minus a square. If I'm not wrong, OK? So this is equal to, to e minus a square divided by a. So please correct me if I make some mistake in the computations, OK? Uh, so let me let me let me write it here so that I will remember. So for any positive a, the integral over these two half lines of this object here is less than or equal than e to the minus a squared over a. Now. I want to pass to any dimension. Huh? And now I want to integrate this. So um, the set of all x less than uh, bigger or equal than a is maybe contained in the set of all set of all in the product in the set of an x such that xi is less than or equal uh, bigger or equal a over a square root of n. So let me check uh, if this is true. So assume that uh, uh, Assume that uh, I have a point in the complement of this. So indeed, if, if uh, xi is less than or equal to a square root over n for any i, uh, then for any i from 1 to n, then uh, the norm of x squared, which is, which is the sum of x squared, is less than or equal. So any xi is less than. Uh, so, uh, so the S square, let me take the square for simplicity. So this is le less than or equal of what? Uh, sum A square over N. Hmm? So if xi is less, for any i, if xi is equal, is less than this, 
then the Euclidean norm, which is the sum of all x squares, xi squared, is less than or equal to the sum of uh, uh, a squared divided by n, which is n a squared divided by n, uh, which is equal to a squared. So if, therefore, we have proven that uh, the set of all x such that x i is less than or equal than a over square root of n for any i 1 to n is contained in the set of all x such that x is less than a, less than a. Okay, we have proven this more precisely. So we have proven this, okay? Okay, and therefore if I pass to the complement, huh? the set of all x having norm larger than or equal to a is the complement of this is contained in, in the complement of this. The set of all x for which there exists an index xi for which this is larger than this. So this is equal, less than or equal, than the integral. Now, now I can take, I can use this, this one-dimensional, this one-dimensional, um, result into the integral of uh, so x1 bigger or equal than a over square root of n of e to the minus y square dy So this is now a one-dimensional integral. It is multiplied by n because I have n factors. Now, uh, the, 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 the only difference is that I have, instead of a, I have this a over square root of n. And therefore, now I can, so now I can use that result, one-dimensional, where now in place of a, I have this new A, this new, in place of A, I, I, so I have, E to the minus a square over N now, and then here I have square root of N and A here, if I am not wrong. Okay, so this at the end is equal to n to the n over 2, which is a number, so it's not very, really very important, e to the minus a square over n, and then here I have another number, which is now a, a to the n. Hope hoping that the constants are correct. Now, I have uh, my, 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 que my initial question was, now take A equal to delta. And so I have to compute 1 over 4 pi t to the n over 2, the integral over this set here. Of e to the minus y square over 4 t in the y. So now I, I apply this result, 
taking in place of a simply delta. And so this is less than or equal to n over n over 2. Then I have 1 over delta to the n. Then I have uh, 4 pi. Yes. Is it correct? I think just A minus minus A squared. Yes. Because divided by So I have e to the minus A square here, right? After the after the DPA. Ah, I have ah thank you. Thank you, because I am yes, I thank you. Yes, I have this, uh, this to the power n. Thank you. Sorry. So this is a square. Then I have, um, so let me, let me recall, I am taking now a equal to delta. So I have 1 over 4 pi t to the n over 2, which is this term. Then I have delta to the n, n to the n over 2. And then I just, just have e to the minus delta square. OK. And then I have uh, I, have, I, have, I have also this 4t, right? OK, this 40, which may be, so I can, so let, let me. First, you have to change the variable. Yes, I could change variable, but maybe here is not needed, because uh, so x is bigger or equal than delta. So, my, so I could put delta here. Huh? If you put the integral to the divergence, first you have to change this y to x because you are integrating by x. This y should be x. No, this, the, I want to use this result. I want to use this result. Yes, yes. But uh, here you have to change first integral. So uh, e to the minus a square, y square. I have this 40 here. So let, let me first try to see what happens if I put delta here. Hmm? Because if x des is less than or equal than delta, then this is less than or equal than minus delta, and therefore minus this is bigger or equal than minus uh, t to the minus y is less than or equal than delta. Maybe I have to change variables. Maybe I think that I have to change variables here. I think that I have to change variables. Let me see. I think that maybe here it is the case to change variable. Huh? Otherwise, I cannot, I cannot uh, manage this, uh, this factor. So, so let me change variable and define um, zeta equal y over 2 square root of t. Hmm? So before doing this passage, I need to make a further computation. So let me change variable. So in this, what happens to this? This is 1 over 4 pi 
t to the n over 2. So now this becomes what? It becomes e to the minus now z square. Hmm? OK, here the domain of integration is if y is larger than this, then z is larger than, so if y is larger than delta, then z, uh, this is equal to z 2 square root of t, uh, and therefore z is larger than or equal than delta uh, z larger than or equal than delta over square 2 square root of t. OK? Then I have dz, dy, dz. So this is equal to 2 to the n uh, square root of t to the n. Hmm? dz. Fine. Now I will try to apply the previous computation. So I have this 2 to the n, maybe this 4 pi to the n over 2. Doesn't matter, these, these are constants. Now I apply this result, this result, where now in place of a, I have delta over 2 over square root of t. So n, n over 2, e to the minus. delta square over 4t e to the minus delta square over 4t. And then, so is it OK? Uh, because uh, I, mean, I repeat, I take a equal now delta over 2 square root of t. So this is a factor. This is a to the minus delta over 4t. And now I have this factor here, which is equal to delta to the n. And then I have here 2 to the n. And then I have here t to the n over 2. Hmm? Hoping it is correct. Hmm? Is it correct? Huh? The, the t shouldn't be here. This t? Yes. Why? Because I have e to the n here at the denominator. Ah, no, it's OK. So it seems to be OK. Huh? Pi. And this goes to 0, as you can see. Now you take the limit as t goes to 0. And because of this quantity, this limit goes to 0. Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, seems too easy. Seems to be too easy. But this apparently is at the numerator and not at the denominator. So let me check once more. I have this at the denominator. And now at the denominator, I have a new quantity, which is this delta over 2 square root of t. And so this goes to 0, st goes to 0, OK?
the root of n, this is not important, let me see, e to the n, this y, e over square root of t, delta, delta, ok, square root of t to the n, Okay. This go converges to zero as t goes to zero plus. Okay, this is the second exercise. So now let, let me come back to the um, now let me come back to the uh, problem of the week. Uh, very important problem of the week, <coughs> maximum, minimum, principle, in bounded domains. Domain. So let me state the following theorem. So let, uh, ah, yes, uh, we, we have already the following notation, QT, if you remember from the previous lecture, QT, so this is uh, time, space, this is QT. Hmm? So this is QT, open and bounded, non-empty. Uh, I gave also probably a name, which now, of course, I don't remember, on, to, this, to this upper part. This was gamma. This was gamma t. Okay, and and this uh, this lateral. So this is gamma t, and then um, and then I have, I gave a name also to this lateral part of the boundary. Yes. St. So in the usual case, we are in the following situation. This is part of a cylinder, so you have over omega. So you have omega here into our n, and then I have, say, capital T. And so Q is just the product of 0 capital T. So you have to think to this situation. Q is, QT is just the product of 0 capital T times omega, omega is an open bounded set of our n, and therefore gamma t is just the interior of this facet, so this is just gamma t, while um, s of t is just the union of this lateral boundary and, uh, and also the, the bottom. Uh, ST. Okay. So now, uh, let U be continuous up to the closure so that uh, it admits maximum and minimum finite. And assume that uh, it is also one uh, differentiable one time, and <coughs> once in time, and twice in space with, say, continuous derivatives in the interior, in the open set here. Hmm? And assume that ut minus Laplace of u is less than or equal 
then 0 in Qt. So this, this is uh, in words, uh, namely U is a smooth subsolution of the heat operator. Okay. Then the max of u over the closure of uh, st is equal to the max of u over the closure of Qt. So please check that the symbols are the same. So Okay, so let us prove this, uh, this, this result. Okay, so first of all, uh, we, want, uh, we want a strict inequality, inequality in one. So to have a strict inequality in 1, we slightly modify u, and so we define v of tx as equal to u of tx minus, for instance, epsilon t, where epsilon is uh, positive. This is for any Tx into uh, the, the open set, Qt. Hmm? Now, now let me compute Vt. So Vt is equal to Ut minus epsilon. So this is a way to produce a strict subsolution because this is equal to this, and on the other hand, the Laplacian of V is obviously equal to the Laplacian of U. Huh? Uh, plus epsilon t. Now I will adjust the sign. Therefore, ut minus Laplace of U is equal to Vt. So take a plus epsilon. So, so Vt minus um, so Vt minus Laplace of U is equal to Ut um, plus epsilon minus Laplacian of Vt minus Laplacian of V is equal to Ut plus epsilon minus Laplacian of U. Uh, so the sign were correct. Uh, so Vt is equal Ut minus epsilon minus Laplacian of U is equal to minus Laplacian of V. And therefore, this minus this is equal to this, which is less than or equal than minus epsilon, which is less than or equal to zero. Okay. Do you agree? Okay. Therefore, V 
is a strict subsolution. Subsolution. Okay. Now the cl claim. Now fix fix now any time tau fix a point fix a point any point arbitrary t bar x bar into the open set t any point here t bar x bar and then fix tau in between, <clears throat> take tau in between t bar and capital T. Hmm? The claim V cannot have maximum v considered in q bar t considered in q bar tau so now now i fix tau now i consider v strict subsolution into this Compact set. Q bar tau. I cannot take a remark, maybe, because you can wonder why we need this tau. Why we don't take tau equal to capital T. We don't, we cannot take uh, tau equal to capital T because we are assuming smoothness up to here and here there is not the closure. If I would have the closure here, then tau would not be required and I could take tau equal capital T. Hmm? Just a small detail. So, so I don't, I, I cannot take for the moment tau equal capital T because the function is not differentiable on this yellow part. In principle, it is not. It's just differentiable inside, but not on the top. Just continuous, but not differential. Okay. The maximum in uh, gamma tau union Q tau hmm? cannot have a maximum. Assume by contradiction, assume by contradiction that T naught X naught belonging to gamma tau union Q tau is a maximum. Hmm? Then <coughs> Laplace of V at T naught X naught at a maximum inside the Laplacian has a sign. It is say like this. And here the Laplacian is no positive. Okay. Namely, minus Laplacian of V, T naught X naught is bigger or equal than zero. Now, what about, so this is 
I want to find the contradiction, so you see, now this is bigger or equal than 0. At t not bigger or equal than 0, at t not x not. We know, however, that everywhere in the open set, this must be negative. And this term is bigger or equal than 0 at that point. You see, it is, this is a point inside somewhere. Yeah. Now, what about dv over dt at t naught x naught? So what about this? Well, if t naught is less than tau, certainly, again, this is a maximum point in time space, so this is equal to 0. Right? If t naught, we, we are working on this compact set, blue one, huh? in principle, t naught x naught could be on this upper part. But there, we only have like this. I mean, it's a maximum reached at the boundary. Therefore, the derivative is uh, uh, bigger or equal than 0. Hmm? So in any case, Either this, if this is true, or this is true. In any case, this is bigger or equal than 0. Therefore, this is also bigger or equal than 0 at t naught x naught. This gives a contradiction. Therefore, the claim is proven. Okay. Okay. So, any maximum point, any maximum point of V in Q bar tau lies on the lateral part in this remaining part uh, in which I've denoted by this. Hmm? OK. Now, we have this u of t bar x bar. So let me come back to this arbitrary point. u of t bar x bar. What is this? It is equal to v. <coughs> v t bar x bar plus epsilon t bar. Hmm? by definition. Now, here is t bar, tau is larger, so this is certainly less than or equal than the maximum over q tau bar of v plus epsilon t bar. Hmm? Because v at this point is, of course, less than or equal than x maximum, hmm? obviously. But if maximum is also equal 
to the maximum of V just only on S bar tau. <coughs> plus epsilon t bar, OK? Hmm? Now, let me now remember who is v. Again, now I want, I want to replace u here. So the maximum now, s bar tau, is surely, S bar tau is just this part of the boundary, and it surely is contained in S bar t. So this is less than or equal than the max of u in S bar t. Huh? u is what? This uh, plus the max over t in S bar t. Hmm? plus epsilon t bar. Is it clear, this passage? Uh, the maximum of v is the maximum of this sum. But the maximum of the sum is less than or equal than the sum of the maxima. So I can take the maximum here plus the maximum here. Hmm? And then I even take the largest part, the largest part of the boundary. I was taking the maximum in this blue part lateral, and now I say it's less than or equal than the maximum in the red. Actually. And this is clearly capital T. Hmm? So we have proven, hence, u of t bar x bar is less than or equal than the maximum of u over the lateral boundary plus epsilon t bar plus, say, capital T. Well, in all the pictures, capital T was positive. Everything was positive. Times were, time was positive. So if you don't like to take the absolute value, you can take capital T without the absolute value. And so now, what do we have? Now, V is not necessarily necessary any, anymore. There is no V here. There is only U. V was just a trick to have a strict subsolution. But now V is not present anymore. And hence, uh, <clears throat> we can take the limit as epsilon goes to 0 to obtain that U at T bar X bar is less than or equal than the max of U. Since this is true for any positive epsilon, I let epsilon goes to 0. And so I have this. OK? Now, now what do I have? Now you see, this is true for any t bar x bar, which does not appear on the right hand side. Therefore, I can take the soup over t bar x bar into qt of u t bar x bar, which is less than or equal than the max of you over this part. OK? But then u is continuous. So this supremum is surely the maximum over the closure. Hence, we conclude, we conclude that the maximum over the closure of u is less than or equal than the maximum over the closure of gamma t, uh, st. So. Is it OK? Hmm? 
Now, the opposite inequality is immediate. See, remark, this is obvious, immediate, because S bar t is clearly contained in this. Hmm? So we conclude that actually we have equality, which is the statement of the theorem. Hmm? So this concludes the proof of the maximum weak maximum principle. And now several comments are in order. Because this is the major tool in the study of parabolic equations. So I, I, I think it's important to make a lot of comments here. So first of all, uh, so first of all, remark one, why weak? Weak maximum principle. Why the word weak? Because the theorem does not exclude theorem does not exclude maximum point of view of view in QT union. Uh, the, the upper bar part was called gamma. Yes. Gamma. <coughs> gamma. This does not exclude. In principle, there could be other maximum points here, in principle. Actually, this is not possible. It can be excluded. However, This can be excluded, but well, this, this can be excluded, but uh, by other arguments. Which have an aim and uh, are a consequence of the strong maximum principle. So for the moment, we just have the weak <coughs> maximum principle and not the strong maximum principle. But you have to know that there cannot be maximum points on this part. Second remark, weak minimum principle. principle for super solutions, for smooth super solutions. It says the following. So let V be continuous intersection C12 over QT be a smooth super solution. in QT, then min, min of V is equal to min over T. The proof is homework Homework but it's it's in this case is not difficult because the idea is simply to define 
u equal minus p. Okay, this uh, this transformation transforms super solutions into su smooth super solutions into smooth subsolutions. So u is a smooth subsolution, and therefore the max of u over q bar t is equal to the max of u over, ga over, sorry, over s bar of t. But this is also equal to the max of minus v over q bar t, which is equal to minus mean over v over q bar t. And this is also equal to max over s bar t of minus v which is equal to minus mean. And this, is, this concludes the homework, actually. So I, I, I was rather quick, uh, but try to check this, uh, these computations. So these are the, the so now in part, uh, hence, for you, for a smooth solution, solution u, since a smooth solution is in particular a smooth super solution and a smooth sub-solution, we have at the same time the weak maximum and minimum principle together. Satisfy, we have the weak maximum, minimum, principle. Together, they are true. OK? So this is the remark number two. Now, what are the assumptions that allow to prove the theorem? Excuse me. Uh, okay. Homework, maybe. Now, homework. Try to prove the following statement. Let omega be bounded, open and bounded, and let u be a continuous function such that in omega no there is time there is no time anymore then try to prove sort of this uh, max Max. Yeah. Now, remark number three. The previous result, the weak max or mean principle is false. in for instance here namely boundedness
boundedness of QT was essential boundedness of QT was essential to have to have the analog of weak maximum minimum principle say one needs to require some growth condition at infinity So in unbounded domains, if you don't make any assumption on the growth of the solution u, for instance, the heat equation, then there can be a problem. And uh, so maybe, maybe before remark 3, before remark three, let, let me no, so let me go on. Remark two point five, maybe, maybe this. The corollary. Before before doing remark three, so let me just uh, do remark two point five corollary. Let you respect V B smooth sub respectively super solution assume that u is less than or equal than v on uh, so the lateral part was called s then u less than or equal than v in qt. So uh, let me prove this corollary. The corollary is very interesting. It says, assume that you have two solutions, or more generally, a sub-solution and a super-solution. Take two solutions. And assume that at time 0, and uh, laterally, you know that this is less than this. Then, necessarily, this remains true everywhere in the domain. This is called the weak comparison principle. Weak comparison principle. This is called weak comparison principle. It is very interesting. It says that if initially you are a solution is below another solution, hmm? and not only initially, but also on the lateral part of the boundary, this is true, then it must be true also inside. Let us prove this corollary, the weak comparison principle. What, do, what did you do? What do you do to prove this? Just take w equal u minus v. Thank you. w equal u minus v. Define w equal to u minus v. OK? So this is, in the, in the good class, is continuous in the closure and C12, because it's the difference of two continuous functions in the closure and C12 in the, in the, in the interior. And uh, what about WT? So WT is UT minus VT. Laplace of V is equal to the Laplace of U minus Laplace of V. And therefore, WT minus Laplace of V is equal to UT 
minus Laplace of u. And then we have minus vt minus Laplace of v. OK? This is by assumption less than or equal than 0, hmm? because u, t, u, u was a smooth sum solution. v was a smooth super solution. Therefore, this is inside the parentheses is larger than or equal than 0, and with the minus in front is less than or equal than 0. Therefore, this is less than or equal than 0. OK? Then by the weak maximum principle, so this is a, a, a subsolution. It's a subsolution. So we can apply the maximum principle. So by the weak maximum principle applied to, to W, huh? The weak maximum principle applied to W implies, implies that the max over the Q closure of W is equal to the max of w. But on st, we have that the maximum of w is non-positive by assumption. Therefore, this is less than or equal than 0. Hmm? And therefore, the maximum of w everywhere is less than or equal than 0. This is less than, and therefore, u is less than or equal than v everywhere. Huh? OK? So remark 2.5. Which is actually very important, is not a remark, is a theorem, is a corollary, is comparison principle, weak comparison principle, has the following consequence. Um, so, the consequence, uniqueness. Uniqueness. So let u and v be, under the previous assumptions, be two solutions, be two solutions of, say, ut minus Laplace of u equal to 0 inside this then u equal to, say, phi, and u equal to u 0 bar at time 0, and this equal to, on the lateral part, so assume that you have this. Yeah, In the corollary? Super solution. Yes, U is a smooth subsolution, and V is a smooth super solution. So that this is less than or equal than 0, and this, and this is larger than or equal than 0, so with the minus is still less than or equal. So this plus this is less than or equal than 0. So you can compare subsolutions with with super solutions. Okay. Is it okay? Is there a problem? 
So this, uh, this is maybe so important, this uh, weak comparison principle, that I prefer to leave it on the blackboard. Uh, oh, by the way, remember that uh, in some lecture ago, we have proven sort of theorem like this for one-dimensional conservation law. You remember the proof? that we made of the comparison principle for C1 solutions of the Burger equation. So this is the analog for the heat equation. So at least, OK. Um, so now assume that you have continuity and the, the compatibility condition between phi at time 0 and u at the boundary. Uh, so plus compatibility conditions between, between phi and u0 bar. Compatibility conditions and assume that phi is continuous, u0 bar is continuous. Uh, so, so let u and v be two solutions of this uh, under the previous stated hypothesis, then U is equal to So if one solution exists in this class under this assumption on omega, phi, u0, and so on, this solution is unique. Again, no claim of ex on existence. We have not constructed the solution. We only say if that the solution exists in this class, then it is unique. Now, uniqueness is immediate. Why is immediate? Because we have comparison. Therefore, u is a subsolution and v is a supersolution. They are equal on the boundary. Therefore, u is less than or equal than v. But u is also a supersolution and v is a subsolution. I can interchange because they are both solutions. They are equal on the boundary, and so u is also larger than or equal than v. So the proof is homework, but uh, proof u is less than or equal than v, and u is larger or equal than v by the weak comparison principle. Weak comparison principle. OK? Fine. Now. Now I can come back finally to remark three. Let me may be more a little bit more precise. Remark three. More precisely. Let me put it like this. More precisely, there exists. And non zero solution, a non zero solution to infinity solution of ut minus Laplace of u equal to zero in. 0 plus infinity times r times r. u of 0 equals 0 at on so it is possible to construct of course a solution to this problem is the, the function identical is 0. It is immediate because the function identical is 0 satisfies this problem. And it is as good. But however, it is possible to construct another solution, non-zero, non-zero solution to this problem. 
This shows that we don't have uniqueness in this unbounded domain case. So uniqueness, huh? so uniqueness is, so we have constructed two solutions of the same PD, of the same Cauchy problem. Therefore, there is no uniqueness. If we don't put any assumption on the growth condition of our solution. When you have an unbounded domain, you would like to put boundary conditions. But it, how, wh what about boundary conditions in this domain? Well, boundary condition in this unbounded domain means that your solution must have at most growth such and such. Huh? Of course, the boundary is, 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 is empty at, at infinity in time, for instance. Huh? So if you want a solution u equal to 0 here, in this unbounded half plane, you would like to put, say, some boundary condition. There is no boundary here. So the way to put quote, quotation boundary conditions is to require that you must grow not more than this and this, such and such. If you don't put any growth condition, you don't have uniqueness. So this is a, an example due to Tikhonov. Maybe tomorrow we can say two words, more, pre more details on this uniqueness, if, we, if, if you want. OK, this is remark three. So uh, now let me go. Sorry. Yes. OK. Now, remark for assume that now I want to consider such a kind of operator. Now assume that I want to generalize with the following assumption. So Iij is symmetric matrix, symmetric matrix is uniformly positive definite, positive definite. uniformly for Tx into Q bar T. And uh, Aij are continuous. Continuous into Q bar T. Assume that Bi is continuous in Q bar T. So then, so this is, you see, if this is the identity, then we have the Laplacian. And if Bi is equal to 0, we have the previous equation. So previous case previous case is Aij equal the identity and Bi equal to 0. OK? 
Okay. Now, if more generally we have this kind of linear, <coughs> but, uh, notice also, just one remark, that if aij is 0, this cannot be considered because we are assuming strict positive definitiveness. So we cannot take this equal to 0. If this would be 0, then this would be the transport equation hmm? that we have studied in the first lectures. But now we don't, as we don't allow to be, in particular, the transport equation because this is positive definite. Okay. Uh, d uh, then the remark is not difficult now, not very difficult, to prove that <coughs> the same results hold, namely, weak, uh, uh, ma weak maximum and minimum principles are true for some solution and super solution. Huh? Weak, maximum, minimum principle for sub super solution on bounded domains. Well, why this is true? You see, <clears throat> if you remember the proof of the, and so, I mean, if this is true, then also the comparison, the weak comparison principle is true, and so on, and so on, and so on and all consequences. Since this is true, then we have weak comparison. And so okay. Weak comparison is true, etc. Hmm? Now, why this should be true? If you remember the proof of the weak minimum and maximum principle, we have constructed a strict subsolution. OK, this we do. And then at, we have essentially everything follows from the fact that a strict subsolution cannot have a maximum point inside or on the top. Why it cannot have? Because the Laplacian there has a sign, and uh, UT also has a sign. That is the principle, essentially. But now, look at this. Take a maximum point. This is 0 at the maximum point. So this uh, creates no problems when you have a gradient part. There is no problem in the weak maximum principle. Interior maximum point are stationary. The gradient is 0. So this, this is 0, no problems. This is as before has a sign, and this, is a, this has a sign because this is positive definite. It's like the Laplacian, more or less, so, essentially. So at the, at the maximum point, still the same. Essentially, you have to change variables, but essentially the idea is that uh, this creates first order term, no problems. Strictly positive definite no, uh, works as in the Laplacian case. Okay, if you want to see the details of the proof here, you can look at the book of the chapter 7, maybe, of the book of Evans. I think that the book of Evans, you should look, probably makes the proof in this case. But the, the spirit is exactly the same as before. Now there is, however, <clears throat> a question mark. Now assume that I want now to consider slight modification. So for instance, this. But for simplicity, take bi equal to 0 and aij equal to identity, so the Laplacian. But then we add, apparently, a innocuous zero order term, no derivatives, where c, say, for instance, could be a constant, but also continuous. Now, 
is the proof of the weak. So take take a solution, okay. or as take a subsolution. Oh, okay. Take equal to zero the, the weak maximum principle for you still working. <clears throat> there is a problem here. So please think a little bit about this question. You will see. So try to reprove the maximum principle for subsolutions. Uh, and then you will see that at some moment there is a problem in the proof. And so what, what, what kind of analog of the maximum principle could hold when there is this zero order term? This is the, the homework. What, what kind of generalization, say your analog of the weak maximum principle when you have this zero order term, can you expect? Okay, so this is the, 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 the answer. So the answer, well, if you, maybe it is better that you don't look at the answer, just try to think of it. Anyway, the answer is again in the Evans book. For instance, in this book, for instance. Maybe chapter seven. So, so the spirit of this is the following. When you have a well-behaved second order operator like this, and the first order, then you can expect essentially maximum principle. When there is the zero order term, then you have to be more careful much more careful concerning the weak maximum and minimum principle. And so tomorrow we will continue about this, uh, this 